Hello internet people, welcome to today's code and beer. Cheers! Mm. I was looking forward to this for a long time. So to give you an idea where we are at, um, first I did some things off stream so one thing is that I made, some, I made some headway on the parsing of JBIG2 symbol dictionaries. So there will be another stream on that, not today, but uh, maybe tomorrow or the day after, about um, decoding symbol dictionaries in JBIG2 files. So a part of that is, is done, but there's still a lot of work to do because they are quite uh, complicated and have many var variants. A second thing I did is I wrote myself a little um, histogram um, code <coughs> that will be very handy in what we will uh, do now. And I always like to have some simple statistics code in my code base because it's it's handy for lots of stuff to have it around and to quickly be able to um, to make descriptive statistics of, of some benchmarks or, or measurements or whatever. And <clears throat> what the idea is for today, um, it, today is a kind of um, preparation or warm-up for something that is to come. Namely, I want to um, introduce uh, some custom memory allocation into my code base rather soon and we will not do it today but uh, today we will do some um, experiments and a kind of empirical warm-up uh, so what the plan is for today is that we get to know the the behavior of uh, malloc of the of the standard c library um, a bit better and we will simply observe some um, behavior of, of malloc in, in different cases and try to learn a bit how it behaves and um, I think it will be an opportunity to discuss some basics about um, heap allocation and will be a good good warm-up and preparation for thinking about uh, our own custom memory management uh, which at the beginning will probably be just a wrapper around malloc with some debugging and testing functionality. For example, what I will I want to be able to do quite soon is to inject allocation errors into my uh, testing. So for example, into my fast testing um, to check the robustness of the code against allocation errors and so on. So that is something that I want to build up over over time, and um, <clears throat> later, uh, later a custom memory allocator can also be used to address some performance topics um, related to dynamic uh, memory allocation and so on. So the first thing I'm doing here is that I. Um, I'm, I'm measuring some <coughs> processor cycles, so C CPU cycles, and uh, building a histogram. And the first thing I do is just let's build let's do the, let's build the baseline by doing it for an empty loop body that does nothing uh, a thousand times. And this is um, an opportunity to. Um, show you how the histogram code is used. So it's very simple. You initialize the histogram. Um, 
you add values to it or samples I call them you add samples to it and in the end you show the histogram and then you can also uh, do some peak finding and so on so that would be interesting so cross <clears throat> One thing I did with the histogram code that I'm also uh, doing in, in most of the code base now, um, which is part of my, let's say, memory management style that I'm trying to establish, is, for example, for the histogram, the histogram itself never does, the histogram code itself never does any dynamic allocation. So it expects uh, the memory buffers that it needs to be passed in and the caller is responsible for allocating the memory here, I just do it on a stack. So then I don't need to care about any, any freeing. And this is a, a pattern that I try to establish and I'm, um, let's say I'm experimenting with this pattern and seeing how, how well it works in the code. Uh, that I don't do memory management at the very low levels of the code. So I want to uh, push the memory management um, up into higher levels of the code and so far I'm quite happy with how this is working out and <clears throat> gives the callers okay so what I was saying before is that I'm trying to establish this pattern where I put where I push uh, memory management uh, out of the leaf functions and and up to the higher levels um, of the core graph. And so far I'm quite happy with this, this because it gives a lot of uh, control to the callers. They can, in simple cases, for example, they can provide stack memory, which is super convenient. Um, so they can provide buffers on the stack for the, for the lower um, callee functions to work on. Also, they can combine um, uh, buffers used by multiple um, callee functions into higher level data structures which is also quite nice and, and efficient and, and simplifies things so this idea that memory allocation should not necessarily happen at the point where the memory is actually used this is something that I'm um, liking more and more the more I do it. So th this is not a typical object-oriented approach where you have all of this encapsulated in the same um, same class. Except if you if you use um, special stuff like placement new and so on, where you can also take more control. But but the usual uh, the usual way is um, to to do it at a very low uh, level in the um, <clears throat> in a code base. So let's see if we can get something to run. Um, not yet. I'm missing something. Ah, yeah. Um, we of course need to link my my histogram code. I will add it to the test dependencies because it for sure will be useful for other stuff. Okay, we got a first histogram. That's already quite interesting in its way. I should add some, some further output to the histogram code. So what I definitely want to see is the number of total samples. <coughs> So let's, I think we can follow statistical convention and simply call it N. And the code itself, I call it N samples because there's also the number of bins. Um, do I need, do I want to see anything else? Oh, 
I could <clears throat> I could exp explicitly show min and max here. I mean they are implicit in the histogram printout, but min and max are, are good to see explicit, I think. So they only make sense if we have at least one sample. So let's <clears throat> let's show min and max samples. So min sample and max sample. That should be useful. Okay, so for doing nothing at all, we are currently seeing 24 to 58 samples, which is quite interesting. So on average, about 32 samples with a standard deviation of four, we have 1000 samples currently. Uh, we see here a kind of <coughs> vertically um, printed uh, histogram in, in bar graph form. Some percentage, percentage and cu uh, cumulative percentage and so on. So this is something that I always want to have for my histograms. <coughs> Let's increase the number of iterations to something meaningful. So let's do a million. And let's see if how crazy the histogram looks. Okay, we are getting here, this histogram is getting too big because of the stupid 880 column limit. It's amazing that we have 2020 and these windows still have 80 columns by default. How big can I make that? <clears throat> Does this actually have more? Because I always try to set, yeah, somehow it remembered that I, I think I usually want to have more. So let's see. Wow, <laughs> we have a huge maximum. So um, this shows a problem with um, with the RDTSC instruction. So that reads the the timestamp counter of the of the core. So we see that we have six hundred ninety three times we have more than or at least one hundred cycles and. The maximum is actually huge, so um, so we are probably getting some um, some effect of multitasking here, so of task switching or multi-threading or hyper-threading or whatever that <clears throat> mixes into our execution and um, modifies the timestamp counter. So one thing we could try is if this situation improves, if we use the Windows uh, query performance counter, which is claimed by Microsoft to solve some of these problems. <clears throat> Otherwise, we can just ignore the very high values and say, okay, they are due to some artifacts. But still, the even the, even the very, um, Even the small numbers, they have quite a lot of variation. So uh, let's first compare this to, to query performance counter. Okay, we already have this undiff. So Uh, let's see. 
let's see if it should work just like that. Okay, now um, it returns a bool for success and gets this uh, large integer pointer, which is actually quite a stupid structure and union and whatever, because it, I think it is uh, from the 30 bit times. I think the quad part is just an AU in 64 basically. So we will, um, we will be a bit dirty here and just ignore the, the return value. Okay, so uh, the histogram isn't that much more reasonable because we have seven, um, seven samples that are very large. Otherwise, it, I think it just looks, mostly looks just better because uh, it uses a larger unit of measurement. So it is not in CPU cycles, but in ticks. And the tick is, is quite a lot longer than the CPU cycle. You can actually query the frequency. So let's first query the frequency. And say And I think the frequency should be in Hertz. So ticks, in other words, ticks per second. Let's also print the, the reciprocal. This is one over Let's print, print this as a float. And so if we print this in seconds, um, let's print this in nanoseconds so we can better relate to it. I hope we can better relate to it. So, and if it's nanoseconds, it's not one over, but um, 10 to ninth. Uh, let's see, did I make this right? I think, um, let's see if the values make any sense. So we have 
about 2.4 megahertz performance frequency so one tick is 410 nanoseconds and that's of course quite a lot of clock cycles so i think I think a tick is 1000 CPU clock cycles or something like that because my CPU frequency I think is probably 2.4 gigahertz or something. So so I think query performance counter is just as bad as, as the RDTSC and has worse resolution here for our purposes. So I think we will just go back to go back to using the RDTSC. And we will just need to need to ignore anything that is below about 30, 30 cycles because that's our measurement overhead here, it seems roughly. And also, so the standard deviation is quite useless because we have these extreme outliers here. So we should probably also you could look at some quantiles so the let's see where the 75 percent quantile for example is is it 26 cycles that's more reasonable so we should <clears throat> probably fix at some quantile or at the median uh, currently, I, I, I also want to add some code to estimate the median from my histogram, but that's currently not there. We just have to eyeball it by looking where, it, where the cumulative uh, percentage crosses 50. So here our median would be between 23 and 24. So that is our baseline for doing nothing. I'm su a bit surprised that it is so much. Um, I mean, we are in debug, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect debug to to add anything between here. I mean, maybe it does not really inline RDTSC. We should add. We should look at a. So let's let's also sorry. Uh, let's also create um, a listing file so we can have a look at how bad the debug code is. How was this listing file flag? Yeah, this, this was this one. Test microbench. Okay, we already have it. So we should have a, a listing file benchmark malloc why does this look so bad is the top stop too small it doesn't really help that much We have two tops. Okay, so it seems to assume a fixed top stop of eight. Okay, let's add this right now to our uh, 
to our WIMRC. Okay, we need a top stop of eight. So, which I normally should have anyway, but because only the shift width should be four, whatever. So let's see if we find an RDTSC here. Yeah, it's literally an RDTSC instruction, which is basically what I expected. And then we have what do we have? Okay, that's interesting. So, <clears throat> aha, yeah, this is because the RDTSC returns. Okay, this is funny. The instruction seems to have a 32 bit interface where it returns in, in DX, in EDX, EAX, and this is then combined here. But I mean, this should be negligible, but maybe the, the storing on the stack could. Yeah, but it should also not take that much time. So let's make an optimized build and see what we get. Okay, this looks actually very, very similar. Very, very similar, which is not too surprising since the debug version already had the literal RDTSC instruction. Uh, so let's see if, if something changed here. No, it's actually code looks exactly the same mm, which makes me a bit suspicious but let's see if we uh, there, there are no compiler flags ah sorry sorry I have the wrong file because I would suspect at least the local variables to be in registers now benchmark malloc where is it? Has it been inline too? Let's search for RDTSC. Probably there in this. Yeah, yeah, now we have registers here. And no, no memory access in between. But still, Still the same, still the same measurement overhead, roughly. Maybe let's see where is the median now. It is a thirty to thirty one. This is actually slower. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> this is actually slower than with the debug build. The median, that's crazy. We have here the largest peak at, at 21 cycles. That's very strange. I'm, I'm spending way too much time now on this do nothing loop, but this is, I find this kind of interesting uh, that we have these, first we have these variations and then they are actually Let's see where the largest peak is in the debug build. It would really be nice if I knew how to 
how to reserve a core for for our process so if if anybody is listening who knows how how to definitely reserve a core and not have any hyper threading uh, mixing in then i would appreciate if you would teach me yeah so the peak is at the same position so at 21 cycles and now we don't have the this is strange why do we sometimes um, i don't know if i'm looking at the, at the i should clean up my windows and start it again because i'm not sure if i'm looking at the correct window so the peak is at 21 yeah the largest peak is at 21. This is also something that I could print here because I have a peak finding routine to print where the largest peak is, but it's here. So about a quarter of the times we hit 21 and the next one is here 26. Okay, so much for doing nothing. Um, it's a bit of a problem that we have these um, this large variation because what I actually wanted to look at is the variation in the malloc timing. So uh, let's first do some let's first do some mallocking. So the first thing we do is just malloc a buffer of one bytes one byte size and let's just to be sure uh, let us just do something with the pointer just so something stupid outside timing um, Just to be used to value so it's it doesn't go some away in the compilation so we are still in debug i would expect debug or non-debug to make a large difference for the behavior of malloc okay so we have a huge huge amount of cyclists now at least 374 cycles. So debug malloc is definitely slow, which is not a huge surprise. Um, so let's increase the range of our histogram by counting increments of 10 cycles for now. So what do we see? We have 1 million samples. The mean is 727. Okay, quite a variation in the minimum, but we see a clear peak here at about 320 cycles. Median is about 400 cycles. And then we have a huge tail and then we have these extreme values, wow, <laughs> up, to, up to more than 18 million cycles. And now, of course, the, the problem is that we, that we 
even have outliers in the with the empty loop body so it's hard to tell whether we are here really looking at some syscall because what i would expect uh, is that malloc most of the time is rather fast because the standard library for sure has some uh, smart heap allocation where it has some some blocks in an arena and it most of the calls they just uh, quickly return something uh, from a pre-allocated block and only rarely when these blocks run out I expect the standard library to really do a break system call where the heap size of the process is actually uh, increased so um, and but even for that 80 million is really quite a lot I mean 80 mi 18 million cycles and that is how much is this 18 million two hundred thousand uh, by 2.4 giga uh, this is 7.6 milliseconds that's really a lot so I'm not sure what we're looking at here okay this timing part of the forensics is getting more difficult than I envisioned so let's first take a look at the at the release build and then we will move on to other parts that i hope will be easier to interpret than timing here so i hope the in the release build malloc will be definitely faster because that's a disaster these 400 cycles yeah, it's definitely it's definitely quite a lot faster. So we are seeing here a median at about 150, 140 to 150 cycles. That looks much more reasonable. So we have the 99 percent percentile. So 99th percentile is at uh, 280 cycles. Yeah, and then we have a very, very long tail. And still we have some huge times. Um, about every 1,000th time, we have quite huge times. Let's let's increase the range of our histogram somewhat so we can see if we can resolve resolve the tail some some more Okay, so it's really far out. It's very, very far out at the, at the many millions. Okay, now we see here some very rare up to this one many millions. Yeah, we also have quite a few in the one hundred thousands range. 
So definitely these are extremely rare outliers here. So let's resolve it a bit finer because the interesting ones, the interesting ones are not the ones that happen once every million time, but that happen once every, maybe every thousand time. This is, this is nice. Now we see that we have kind of a secondary peak here. So it's, uh, it's not visible in the bars because they are used up by this huge peak here. But you can see that there is something like a secondary peak at about 100,000 cycles. And this is 100,000 cycles is Forty-two microseconds. Yeah, this this would this sounds much more reasonable for a for a call where where the where the run the runtime library needs to get extra memory. Uh, <clears throat> And would be interesting how many, I maybe should have a more detailed cumulative count here. I mean, we can do something easy that for, for now, we just, we only add to the histogram if it is really a large value. So if elapsed is larger than a thousand cycles, then we add so we can see more detail of the secondary peak. Yeah, so now we see it much more clearly. Still we have, okay, so we have more, more structure below 10,000 cycles still. What we now see is speak here so let's let's first say even larger than 10,000 cycles Now we should, yeah, now we should have only this, this structure here. And how much we have about 600. So that means if we have 1 million That means every 1,700th time, about 1,690 time. So let's note that down. I always forget to close these windows. Uh, we have about, yeah, let's say about 100,000 cycles. Um, we cannot yet tell um, the amount of memory that this corresponds to because while we are every time only allocating one byte for sure there will, we will soon see that there is some uh, heap allocation overhead and actually not one byte is consumed but 
probably something more like 16 bytes or so. Let's see. Here we find out. So, um, let's say if it is 16 bytes, then this would be about 26 kilobytes, strange size. Yeah, let's see, let's see later. Let's just note down our observations here. So now we will, we will look at the range up to 10,000 and larger than 1,000. So let's see what we see in this range. I have no idea if at the end of the day we will be able to make some sense of all these numbers. Yeah, at least we see some we see some structure, something like a peak um, at about four thousand six hundred. Here is also also peaked at a thousand so let's maybe separate out everything larger than three thousand currently so we can separate structures I again forgot to close <clears throat> yeah four thousand six hundred three four four I forgot. Yeah, two thousand nine hundred per time, let's say. Let's write like this. So this is a lot less about twice as often. And now let's look at the uh, at another range. Uh, let's resolve more finely. Okay, so this cutoff at 400 is not a natural choice. So I think this time we should just go down to zero. Okay, so now we see a clear peak, clear peak at 120 cycles. Now let's shift this so we get some idea of the orders of magnitude. And then we could see say there is kind of a secondary structure above 200 so let's finally resolve that one a bit more mm, yeah a rather clear peak structure at 260. 
That's interesting because it's very often. Okay, we let that stand for now as it is. We try to inter interpret it some more later. So, what I want to look at now is um, to get an idea of the allocation um, overhead and so on. I want to look at two things. Uh, one is I want to look at the difference in the pointers that we get. So let's make this a byte pointer so we can subtract. We have a previous pointer. And so if we have a previous pointer, we will add to the histogram of the pointer difference a value pointer minus previous. So just the increment of the pointer from one allocation to the next. This is a separate histogram that we will build. No idea what uh, a good choice here is. We will see. Um, yeah, we can also. I mean, usually I expect positive differences. Let's for the f let's first center the, the histogram um, at zero. <clears throat> let's now not print this one for now. We are now interested in the pointer diff. And let's see what we get. An error. We get an error because we forgot to cast the pointer. And we get this time exactly what I suspected. A huge peak at 16. So we know that for a, a one byte um, malloc, actually 16 bytes are consumed from the heap. This is quite exactly what I would have expected. So why, why would I have expected this? Um, you just need to consider the, the interface of the memory locator in the standard library. So you have the malloc call that, that reserves memory and you have the free call that frees the memory again. And the free call takes only one argument, the pointer. It does not take the size. 
So the standard library must remember the size that you allocated at a certain address. And it has to store this size some, somewhere. And what's typically done in the standard library is that you have um, on the heap, if you, if you, um, if you malloc a buffer, you typically, typically have a kind of struct on the heap, actually, that first has a, a size field and then your data. So let's just um, write it as a variable size array. So you get the idea. Something like this is, is really put on the heap typically um, you have a size and then your actual data so this would be eight bytes already now why is it 16 bytes well two reasons uh, one is alignment so you usually will want to have the structure aligned at, at eight byte boundaries so if you, even if you have here only one uh, byte data if you align the whole structure the next one will be actually at, at 16 byte increment. But there is a second reason and this, that is uh, free lists. So if you free the data again, what often is done in, in memory allocators is that this structure is replaced by a second structure that also has a size but also has a, a pointer to the next free region. And so this would be two times eight bytes and, and so you have 16 bytes. That would be a very typical overhead or, or it's, it's not the overhead. The overhead itself is, is let's say eight to, um, eight to 15 bytes overhead because probably we will see later if you allocate eight, maybe you also get 16 bytes consumed. So you have an overhead of overhead of at least eight which is needed for the size and I mean it's, that's not the only way not the only way uh, the allocator could do it so it could have more elaborate ways to find out how big the block was because it could check in which area uh, the block was allocated and maybe all, all of the blocks in the, all of the allocations in the area uh, have the same size because it's a, a pool of that is used only for a certain size but these checks would be quite expensive I guess um, I mean uh, it's been a long time since I wrote a memory allocator and I only ever wrote quite simple ones so I don't know all the tricks you can do but um, I know that this this kind of structure that I put on the screen uh, is quite quite common. So yeah, um, I, I wanted to further look at the data. So because this is not the only thing we have, we also have larger larger offsets from one allocation to the next. So some of them are even quite huge. Some are even negative, which is interesting. Would be interesting to see if we only have the negative ones at the beginning when there are still some holes to be filled, maybe in the heap, I don't know. Uh, we could we could check check this. So so the large the large ones. So we have zero here everywhere. So if we have a large one, it is really large, and um, I would expect that the large ones happens happen when a new a new block is requested by the by the standard library. And so let's first let's first check um, if the negative ones only occur at the beginning. 
So let's not do the statistics for the first, um, let's say for the first 10,000 iterations, let's not do this. I mean, let's see if this makes any difference. <clears throat> yeah, you see, now the, now the negative ones are gone. Um, we have now the minimum at, six, at 16. And actually I, have a <laughs> actually, I have a bug in my... I have a bug... I have a bug in my histogram code here. Sorry, let's fix that first. So the handling of these overflow bins and so on, this is always tricky in histogram code. So I messed something up there. It has to do with this uh, lowest min sample. which is only valid if the highest is low. Because here I have the underflow bin there's something inconsistent because the underflow bin has a count of two, even though the minimum is 16. So there is something wrong. There is something wrong. This is always so confusing. So we are definitely not in a regular bin. Let's print some debug info. So as regular seeing this is all fine. We have a count of four. And still the minimum is 16. How is that possible? That is inconsistent. How do we get this count of four?
I need to find out where where this strange value is coming from. Okay, so we get an x16. And this is for some reason ends up in the wrong bin. So I made a very stupid mistake somewhere. That was not the plan that I need to I need to debug I need to debug my histogram code here and it gets even stranger. We have uh, actually a rather high index which is fine. Maybe this is already non-zero at the beginning. There is something strange going on. We do not want to abort here. Yeah, it is already already in the beginning. Is our initialization broken or do we have some Buffer overflow. That is really annoying that we have this problem now. Yeah, we can just exclude some courses and see where it comes where it's coming from. I'm sorry for this. Okay, this seems actually reasonable because if you have such a large negative offset, yeah, then, so this is reasonable. So, so the problem is caused by this one. And this seems to overflow the buff overrun the buffer. Because probably if we put here some some dummy buffer, probably the problem magically vanishes. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> it does not magically vanish. Then my Bluetooth stopped working. This is getting really bad. <clears throat> People, what is going on? I am really embarrassing myself here. I cannot even write histogram code.
yeah now now it is fine so if i there is some problem caused sorry there is some problem caused by this one this is does something illegal so let's add some assertions I am stupid because I add assertions in the release build where they do not do anything. That is not smart. And we have an assertion failure, which is a one step forward. Okay, I may be naive, but I would have expected the debugger to stop at the location of the assertion. Is this not a reasonable expectation? Uh, let's set a conditional breakpoint. Yeah, here is the problem. It must be this case. What is delta? We, oh, it's out of scope. It is out of scope. Low is zero. X is... So delta pin width is... 10. Sorry, so what do we have here? So we should have 101 and then we add 1. Okay. Yeah, that is that is wrong so we have an off by one error here the classic and that's so embarrassing because that's why everybody says you shouldn't be programming in C++ because you make these off by one errors and you overrun your buffers and everything goes to hell. Um, yeah, because Mm. 
<clears throat> and I must emphasize that I coded this histogram before the first beer. I think now everything is working. So let's remove the debugging code and let's go back to normal it operation. Yeah, you see the problem is that I this mistake happened because this one plus I added this only later and I did not check the condition again. Mistake. Mistake. Um, Okay. I'm a bit. Oh, this is the debug build. Yeah. Yeah. This is another thing that I wanted to know actually. This is something that I expected that uh, the heap allocation overhead is actually quite a lot larger in debug build makes absolute sense because uh, probably um, you could expect the debug build yeah exactly we have always now we have practically always 16 we have no negative ones so the negative ones were really from filling out the holes in the heap at the, at the first few um, first few um, allocations now we have no negative ones as we skip the first ones. We have an absolutely huge peak at 16, which is the expected um, granularity that we have from allocations. And we have a couple of large ones. And we have them about about every 20,000th time, 20,500th time. Is this right? I don't think that's right. No, every about 2,000th time. And this is quite close to 2048. So for malloc one, typically we have 16 bytes um, and every about 500, uh, 12th time, no, every 2050th time uh, larger. So now what I expect is that that means that we have 32k blocks. that we are getting our uh, small allocations from. <clears throat> so let's, 
let's see. This would also somehow fit together with this that uh, about every 2000 something's time. So we maybe should reprofile this with skipping the first ones that fill up holes in the heap. Um, we have a substantially so 20 times larger so um, runtime of malloc. That's probably when we get a new 32 kilobyte block. Um, So that makes sense. Now, let's go to a larger blocks, a uh, larger malloc size to check our assumptions. So let's, let's choose a block size that will give us the next larger. So I assume that up to up to eight bytes, we should we should get the sixteen. So let's put eight here. Let's close it. Yeah, we still get the sixteen. A very similar picture also with the larger. The larger offsets and when we choose 9 we should get something like either 24 24 or 32 we get 32 actually so it's it's really a 16 byte um, alignment. Okay, we have one negative one here. We get a 16 byte alignment and this is something I mean it's quite significant if you for example if you do a lot of very small malocs you should be aware that you are really wasting a lot of your um, of your cache space uh, because of your cache lines because usually the the cache lines how long are they are they 64 bytes or I don't recall offhand but uh, definitely you are you are you're wasting um, because normally even if caches and so on can be associative uh, you have at the at the very small structure level, you usually have um, everything is grouped into lines, and and uh, the CPU, for example, and and the memory controller and so on, they all think in larger units of memory. So, uh, whatever you have in small units of let's say within 64 bytes is really physically mapped um, and is not somehow scrambled or associated uh, differently by the memory management unit and so on and by the cache controller and you can you can imagine that if you have your actually useful data and then in between you have always this this heap allocation overhead that this costs you a lot of the so you can easily waste half of your of your cache memory for example with this that's one reason why small allocations are not are not performing well. So the rule is always if you want to be fast, you allocate in, in blocks and not uh, not individual small objects. Okay. Um, so we have let's write this down. So we have some results. Pointer diff for malloc nine is actually thirty two bytes, and we have the same pattern that um, no, sorry, we should have now 
now this should we should use up the, the block twice as fast I would expect so let's let's check if that actually happens um, Interesting, it doesn't happen. That that would mean that also the block is twice as large. So it's still <clears throat> At the end, uh, I should really look uh, if I if I can find the source code of of, of the of the memory allocator to actually um, find out why why we get these these results. But the I wanted to set as a goal for today to really um, use only the return value of malloc to find out as much as possible um, about. Uh, the the allocator. So let's go to one um, one step larger, and then uh, we will look at another thing which also will, could be interesting. So let's go to to the first size that will give us something larger than thirty two. So I would expect that we can go up to twenty four and still have. 32 bytes consumed. And let's verify that. Yeah, we still have 32. Same number of larger offsets and 25 should be the first size that gives us, let's say 48. Yeah, now we have 48 and now we actually see more frequent larger offsets. That means now we actually see a larger block size or no, now we actually see maybe the same block size but used up more quickly. Let's see if the numbers make some sense. So we have pointer size, pointer diff for malloc 25 is 48 bytes and every one, three, seven, seventh uh, time we see a larger allocation. Let's see where this gets us. Yeah, so I think we are, we are still we are still at the 64k block. And all of these numbers are release build numbers. Because we saw quickly that in the debug build we have much larger uh, malloc overhead, which is reasonable because you expect a debug version of the standard library to, for example, put some uh, put some sentinels before and after heat blocks, for example, and check on on freeing, for for example, on freeing the memory, also maybe in between, but on freeing the memory, check whether the sentinel bytes are still intact, and if they aren't, that's that's a sign that you have some buffer overruns, uh, heat buffer overruns in your in your code. So, and we saw that I think the the blocks the, the 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 allocation size was at least sixty four bytes in the debug debug um, configuration build. But let's stay in the in the re release build for now. So that makes that makes sense. We have a certain block size. 
now I want to go to the next thing. So the next thing I want to look at is I want to look at the low the low bits of the pointer. Can get rid of that. So And let's think about because what we want to see is if we have um, blocks of memory that are aligned to some page boundaries or some multi page boundaries, what we would like to see is um, whether whether the addresses are distributed uniformly over the page or whether there is, for example, what I expect um, a header at the beginning of, of the page, a multi-page block that is never used for user heap objects and is used for some um, housekeeping information of the, of the heap allocator. So by the way, I'm, I'm always adding here two bins because there's an overflow, there's a an, an, um, negative and positive uh, overflow bin at either side. So that's why I'm adding two. Um, so we will start this histogram at one and let's say we want to cover the 16, the 64K. Uh, so we would say 16 bytes is, is the resolution we will uh, use to look at these things. Uh, let's also disregard the first 10,000. So because they are maybe filling some holes or something. And let us just cast a pointer <clears throat> and mask it, mask the lower 16 bits. And let's have a look at it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I should really pipe this to a file. Okay. That is so far not really what I expected.
uh, we do see a clear pattern which is clear because we are now allocating in um, 48 byte increments so we have here every three lines a peak that makes sense but uh, what I would have expected is to see some structure at the beginning at the low bits that are page or multi-page aligned we don't really see we don't really see that I mean we see we see changes and here now a lot of uniformity uh, let's go back to the the Melokuan Yeah, I expected to get something more uniform then. So not every three lines, but every line used. Uh, So basically we see complete uniformity here and some rounding errors and then a halving here at at a somewhat strange number so let's let's do some hex conversion of this number <clears throat> yeah not really the most um, <laughs> not really the most suspicious number in binary I mean, this would be getting closer to a bit suspicious. So, yeah. So, so this would this would be getting closer to the thirty-two k um, block boundary. It's interesting that we seem to have some offset from the interesting numbers. So ha huh. Okay. We start to see a bit of a pattern here. We have here an offset that so this this halving repeats exactly 32k bytes later yeah <laughs> we see a bit of a structure but not exactly the structure i expect We see a structure that repeats with a period of 32k, which is, which makes sense because um, 
The 32K, this, this was the block size that we noticed uh, for the very small Mallox. So that makes sense that we see um, a frequency structure that repeats with 32K. But still, why is it, why is it halving this? I mean, this halving this somehow looks like we are we are looking at a too too small um, too small number of of trailing bits. So we get some some wrap around. Let's try, let's try a larger number of training bits. Uh, let's add one bit more here. Uh, and let's decrease the resolution of the histogram to half. and build does it build the micro bench yeah This did not have the effect of unwrapping any any structure. So with tiny font size, we can see these notches in the histogram. So we see something going on. not something I can really make sense of at th this time. I mean, we see that there's some periodicity with uh, about 32K. That we saw when converting here, the numbers. And so we see some kind of block structure going on, but we cannot really tell the, it's, it's not that we don't see 
um, the beginning of, of a certain aligned block to be used or not used. Let's also try if we if we look at 4k pages, 4k byte pages, like let's try that. Um, let's see if we have some some luck there. Okay, now of course we see the 16 byte alignment, yeah, that's for sure. And we don't, don't see much else going on. Of course, we see some some wrapped shadows of, of the structure that we saw before. But the interesting thing is we saw the structure at 32K and it didn't really get more pronounced at larger powers of two. So I'm not sure exactly what to make of that. Maybe it's just that we do not really have these block these block headers because I mean the mem the memory allocator does not does not have to put um, its housekeeping data inside the blocks. It can keep them on the side, uh, which may be actually a smart thing to do um, for the allocator because usually you would expect that these block operations happen rather infrequently so the housekeeping data should be rather cold considering that the cache access patterns and so if you move it out of the way that could actually be be a win so uh, maybe they are just not uh, in line with the with the blocks used for allocations so it looks like there's not really a strong pattern of, of some parts of, of blocks not being used for user data. I would somehow like to repeat the timing measurement for larger allocations, uh, but I think I'm getting a bit too tired for that now. Um, <clears throat> So let's see, can we consider the experiment a success? I'm not completely sure, so um, we learned some things. So we learned, we learned something about the typical um, time that it, uh, um, a small malloc takes. So we are here in the, in the region of a couple hundred cycles. We we also could confirm something that was highly to be expected that um, we have some block structure going on in the in the malloc allocator the block structure has a plausible block size 32 or 64 blocks uh, kilobyte per block and 
as expected, we see that once we have used up a block, the next malloc then uh, takes significantly longer, so about 20 times longer. And then we also have very large, uh, some very large times that still seem to be quite regular. And for those, I would expect that those could correspond to the break system calls, where the, well, at least on Unix, I think it's called the break, um, where, where you increase the, the heap space of the process. Um, we, could, we could quickly check if there is some um, easy way to query this information in Windows. So so from the from the operating system. Okay, this is specific to this, these Windows heap functions. Some things that could be interesting, like queries for page sizes. So of course the heap, um, what was this heap query information? Sounds interesting. And the question is just, I, I don't have the, the Windows API experience to um, to tell if the if the standard C library is actually using this um, this system that we have here with these uh, Win32 cores. Okay, I think I, I won't go in, into this today. Um, before one, one dives into this kind of detail, it would probably make much more sense to see if you, uh, you can actually look at, uh, at the source of the, of the standard library, for example. But let's just try if we can, let's go to debug build. I didn't even try yet if I can actually step within malloc. Let's check this.
<clears throat> okay. <laughs> it, it actually knows the source file, but uh, I probably don't have the source file. Yeah, I have no idea what, what is really in, in here. Uh, the re redistributables are probably just binary. I didn't check if there's if I actually have some runtime library source. Or if this is available at all, I don't I don't even know. Okay, won't find find it out today. Um, yeah, so limited success, I would say. Um, the most interesting for me are probably these numbers for orientation. So if I, for example, if I if I want to uh, build my my own uh, memory locator. Obviously, f for performance reasons, only makes sense if I can match these numbers. However, there are, there are other reasons to um, to use custom memory allocation functions, for example, as I said, for uh, fault injection and testing and so on. So I will definitely do it, even if um, it later turns out that it's not really re relevant for performance reasons. I did not find out too much of, about the blocks, except some estimate of the block size that is used. What we, what we did not try is to, um, to vary the, the size of the allocated uh, uh, buffer could be interesting to see um, if we get some association of the of so some correlation of the size and the and the pointer uh, region that we get because often often memory locators will group together allocations of the same size in order to um, fight fragmentation of heap memory. So this is something I would expect to see that if you, for example, alternate between one and one and nine bytes, would not be surprising to see that also the addresses alternate with some, some offsets and you get them from two different blocks, for example. So, uh, but yeah, I think the timing is, is for now the most important here. The other thing is basically what I expected and I would have hoped to see some bit clearer pattern. We, I mean, the absence of a pattern uh, in the least significant bits maybe teaches us something that, as I said, that the heap allocator is keeping its data mostly on the side, except for, for these uh, fast access structures for fast allocation and deallocation that are in line. So maybe the, the larger housekeeping data is, is um, on the side somewhere. Mm, would make sense, I think. It looks like this, or looks like that, is the case. Okay, um, I think I'll leave it at that for now.
thanks for watching if you stayed and see you next time bye